Well, welcome everybody and thanks for joining us. I see there's about 84, oh, 86, 87, it's increasing um, uh, participants. So welcome everybody on this nice, gorgeous spring day in Toronto. Hope it's uh, nice weather where you are um, for another session of our uh, OICR JLAPS Cancer Symposium Series. And um, for this session, we have a really exciting topic. Um, uh, on how cell and gene therapies can transform the treatment of solid tumors. And we have a really great uh, lineup of, of speakers for you that I will be introducing, including a panel discussion. Uh, before I start, um, I'd like to give the uh, land acknowledgement. Um, uh, uh, we acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, then the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Since this is a virtual meeting and many others may be on different territories, please uh, take the time to reflect and honor uh, the Indigenous communities um, of your territories. So I'm going to just, um, you know, set the stage here. Uh, we're going to be talking about cell and gene therapy. And as you know, cell and gene therapy has revolutionized uh, the, the field of cancer. Um, I was, uh, 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 you know, I, I, I've done many years in the area of cell therapy, working with tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And the bottom line is now in 2022, um, as you'll hear from our speakers, we have a plethora of different cell therapies to choose from. And it's actually becoming challenging. We have, of course, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, gene engineered T cells, CAR T cells, single and dual antigen recognizing CAR T cells, we have now drug-specific CAR T-cell receptors where you use an antigen and then that drug attached to it you can then target any antigen you want with the T-cell. We have T-cell receptor transduced T-cells. We have now TILs that are being transduced with CARs <laughs> as, as, a, as a therapy. And we have universal allogeneic uh, cell therapies, CAR T-cells. We now have NK cells with CARs. And we have even CAR macrophages now and gamma delta T cells with and without CARs. And now another area now that's up and coming is engineered B cells, adoptive cell therapy with engineered B cells and plasma cells. Um, so that's an exciting area too as well to produce antibodies against cancer. And so next slide, please. And so the question now and the huge challenge which uh, we need to address in the whole field is how do we balance specificity efficacy with toxicity? Keep in mind, these are live drugs and this balance between potency, migration, persistence, specificity and toxicity is becoming a real issue, quality of life and, and how we, and then with reference to the solid tumor uh, space. So uh, this is gonna be an exciting session. And with that said, I'd like to introduce, um, um, I think, uh, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if Dozy is introducing yourself. So Dozy, please introduce yourself and we'll go from there. Thank you, Laszlo. And thanks everyone. Thank you for that background. It's been great to partner with OICR on this seminar series, as we're excited to have our diverse speakers today. My name is Dozy Amuzi and I'm head of JLabs here in Canada. For those of you who may not be familiar with our JLabs model, I'll just say a few words about that before we jump in. JLabs is part of the larger Johnson & Johnson Innovation Network, and it includes deal teams and therapeutic area experts for early stage development in various global locations. We also have a well-established venture capital arm, that's JJDC. So no matter what stage where your company is, j Labs and our Johnson & Johnson Innovation Network provides access to various elements that healthcare innovators would need to position themselves for success. The depth and breadth of our healthcare expertise combined with our global presence is unique for startup incubation and partnerships. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we really like great ideas and we are passionate about eliminating the obstacles that healthcare innovators face. So at JLabs, we aim to help companies navigate the complicated healthcare startup environment by providing access to mentors and advocates through our global Johnson & Johnson network. We also have some entrepreneurial programs and other life science resources that would support innovators. So 
our no strings attached model enables emerging co companies to accelerate their science while still maintaining control and complete um, decision making with their IP and so forth. It is designed to be flexible to allow early stage companies to gain access to just what they need in a very capital efficient manner. Next slide, please. So during our um, session today, we recognize that you might have some questions. Please add them to the Q&A button or you click a raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. We will address as many questions as we can during the panel. And with that said, I will hand it back to you, Laszlo, to introduce our keynote speaker today. Great, thank you, Dozi. Thank uh, oops, so I'm going to put my video back on. Uh, thank you, Dozi, for this uh, uh, introduction. And it's really my extreme pleasure to introduce to you Catherine Ballard from the Children's National Health System. Um, Catherine is an amazing researcher. And um, I got to know Catherine when I was a, a faculty member at MD Anderson Cancer Center, where we had a lot of collaborations with the Baylor College of Medicine. And she was there in Malcolm Brenner's group working there in cell therapy. And we, you know, we worked on a lot of a number of collaborative projects. So, uh, Catherine, as I said, went on and has done some amazing things, especially in the pediatric space. And um, she's the Bosworth Chair for Cancer Biology and the Director of the Cancer Center in Immunology Research, and Director of the Program for Cell Enhancement and Technologies for Immunotherapy of Children's National Health System. Um, she's also Professor of Pediatrics and Microbiology and Immunology and Tropical Medicine at the George Washington University and the Associate Center Director for Translational Research uh, and Innovation at um, GW uh, Cancer Center. Um, so it's really my pleasure to introduce Catherine and she'll be talking about cell therapies for cancer and beyond. So please uh, welcome Catherine, looking forward to your talk. Thanks so much, Laszlo, for a um, very kind introduction. And uh, I, um, I guess when Laszlo invited me to speak, he um, was uh, prepared for a bit of a uh, controversial <laughs> discussion. So I'm going to, hopefully you guys can see this because I, I sometimes uh, when you can, can you guys see the, Laszlo, can you see the title or is this... Um, Yes, we can see it. I, I, we can see it. Yes. Okay, great. So I'm going to talk to you today about um, cell therapies for solid tumors and focusing the areas that we work we've done beyond um, CAR T. As Lazo just told you, there's so many different uh, types of cell-based therapies that are being explored, and especially in the solid tumor space. And I can't obviously go through all of those, um, but I will speak to some of the technologies that we've been developing. I do have um, disclosures both in the um, CAR-T and in the um, antigen-specific T-cell space, so um, that either you choose to believe anything I say or not, but these are my disclosures. Um, so we're gonna be talking today um, mainly about the multi-antigen specific T cells, but you know this just gives you the flavor of what our options are from um, chimeric antigen receptor T cells, which you know really I don't need to belabor the point what they are, but just briefly, um, you the, this is the CAR construct with a um, single chain variable region of a monoclonal antibody, uh, followed by a spacer or a linker. Um, the um, co-stimulatory moiety, and then the TCR zeta chain. So when the Eugene engineer your T cell to express the CAR, uh, now it recognizes its target like an antibody would through the single chain variable region of the monoclonal antibody, but it kills it like a T cell. Um, but, you know, that's very high engineering, doesn't need MHC, um, very, um, which is an attraction, certainly in solid tumors, which does downregulate MHC as a potent immune evasion strategy. Um, but as you'll see, you know, the probably, you know, one of the more um, durable uh, cell therapies in the solid tumor space has been the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Um, the idea here is that the T cells that you pull out of the um, tumor microenvironment, some of them will be tumor specific. They recognize uh, the tumor in the context of the patient's own MHC um, and their 
polyclonal, polyfunctional T cells. Problem is you don't know exactly what they're targeting. There may be uh, non-specific or even energic T cells there. Um, so, you know, the strategy that we've looked at is trying to pull out uh, those T cells like in a TILS microenvironment uh, that recognize antigens of interest and really bring ex, ex vivo expand those sort of multi-antigen specific T cells uh, to um, target and kill um, tumor cells. So I'm going to talk a bit about this. I'm going to talk about uh, CAR NK cells and um, uh, we'll see where we go. And I think that's, you know, why we're here, because there has been an enormous amount of activity using CAR-T in the solid tumor space. Um, here are just some of the targets. You know, one of the disadvantages with um, traditional CARs is that they have to recognize ex extracellular antigens, and there's only a limited number of those in the solid tumor setting. Um, and so, you know, what that's translated to is a plethora of activity, clinical activity, using CAR T cells for solid tumors. And other than some small series, especially in neuroblastoma, this was work came out of um, uh, Baylor. Uh, recently, there's been um, some uh, anecdotal um, reports or single um, case reports in the um, GBM and brain tumor space. But overall, it's not been a home run like it has been for uh, blood cancers or in particular uh, ALL or diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So there's still work to be done in the T cell or cell based therapies for solid tumors. And I, you know, really want to bring us back to where it all started, you know, Steve Rosenberg and um, TILS for metastatic melanoma, um, expanding these sort of tumor reactive um, specific tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, um, and then, you know, which are obtained from a, a metastatic lesion and then infused back into the patient after ex vivo expansion. And certainly dramatic um, effects can be seen with TIL therapy, understanding though that these TILs are given in the context of um, lymphodepleting uh, chemotherapy followed by high dose IL-2. So it's not a single agent therapy, but clearly uh, can be a very potent immunotherapy. And with overall response rates in, in the order of about um, 50%, with CR rates in the order of about 20%. But I think what's impressive is if you do get into a CR, you do see this flattening of the curve and um, these um, complete remissions do indeed seem to be uh, durable. So this really speaks to the potential for these sort of antigen specific T cells recognizing tumor in the context of their native alpha beta TCR um, it, rather than an engineered receptor uh, in this setting. You know, metastatic melanoma, as I said, you know, has had pretty good traction. Um, as you heard from Laszlo, that's also been able to broaden applicability to other centers, including MD Anderson and Moffitt, and there's now um, pharma, um, you know, led studies. Um, but outside of melanoma, there, there have been some impressive um, cases reported, some are highlighted here, but again, not quite the same home run as uh, in uh, the melanoma space. So that's where, you know, the, one of the questions is, well, is that because when you are pulling out the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, you don't really know what they're targeting. So is there an opportunity to, to select or expand those tumor specific T cells of interest? And this was certainly a space that I was particularly interested in when I first um, came to Baylor um, because of the work that had been done there using antigen specific T cells um, for uh, EBV lymphomas after solid organ transplant and bone marrow transplant. And these are highly immunogenic uh, tumors that um, 
uh, very um, attractive for adoptive cell therapy and certainly um, published um, success uh, in multiple different studies of over 91% uh, success rate without needing uh, prescribed lymphodepletion or post um, uh, T-cell infusion um, immune therapies. Uh, you can see that um, pretty robust profile with um, very little in the way of toxicity with uh, limited um, CRS and, uh, and graft versus host disease. So I was certainly interested in trying more challenging targets like the type 2 latency uh, EBV tumors in um, Hodgkin lymphoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Uh, this is also the latency tumor in nasopharyngeal carcinoma, where you have much more a limited array of uh, antigens to target. Nevertheless, uh, latent membrane protein 1 and 2 are potential targets. So this was in the old days when we used gene engineered antigen presenting cells, in this case dendritic cells and EBV transformed B cells uh, to stimulate and expand um, a T cell product that was specific for either LMP2 alone or LMP1 and LMP2, depending on which um, adenoviral vector we used to gene engineer our antigen presenting cell. So depending on the um, uh, vector that we use to gene engineer our APCs, uh, the product was either LMP2 specific or both LMP1 and LMP2 specific. Again, we gave these cells without prescribed lymphodepletion or any other therapy. And in patients with active disease, we had, saw a 50% disease-free survival at two years. And in those um, who were high risk for relapse, we saw a 90% disease-free survival at two years. Um, understanding that in um, this population uh, where we have strong CIBMTR data uh, that uh, the expected disease-free survival here would be in the order of around about 50%. And what we did show, and we learned, you know, we, we extrapolated this from the um, cancer vaccine space is we showed that uh, patients who were responding had this um, evidence of really antigen spreading, meaning we saw expansion of T cells in the peripheral blood post infusion uh, to targets that were not EBV targets. So these are tumor associated antigens expressed by the patient's tumor, um, but were obviously not targeted by the LMP T cell product. So I'm pointing this out because it was the first evidence of uh, antigen spreading after adoptive T cell therapy. And it's something we've continued to explore as we've moved beyond um, virus uh, specific T cells. So with this um, product, we then also evaluated it in the post allo transplant um, setting. And um, we and others have really explored this type of therapy as an off the shelf um, strategy. Um, we have recently completed two studies using this product and or a, a very similar product uh, through the Children's Oncology Group and the um, uh, PBMTC. Um, but this off-the-shelf third-party um, EBV T-cells um, has been around actually for quite some time. And I'm showing you this because the off-the-shelf CAR T-cells, um, admittedly, you know, they're gene engineered, have had a much more challenging uh, safety profile and efficacy profile. And um, actually with this um, third-party EBV T-cells um, for um, PTLD, post-transplant was pioneered um, back in 2007 um, by Dorothy Crawford in the UK. And um, multiple studies have been um, done since then, including multi-center study that we conducted out of Baylor, and most recently a study that came out of um, uh, Sloan Kettering. Uh, but overall, we're seeing between 50 and 70% um, response rates depending on whether these patients are post solid organ transplant or bone marrow transplant. And surprisingly, very, very little in the way of toxicities. 
Moreover, we've seen, particularly in patients with um, CNS PTLD, that there's been surprising responses, and these are um, responses seen in our group at Baylor and at Sloan Kettering, um, with this tumor that tr traditionally has been very difficult to treat and, um, and showing that the T cells obviously can cross the blood-brain barrier. So we've this was sort of setting the scene for these antigen specific T cells and certainly there's um, been a lot of activity, um, including a company called Atara. Um, our technology was licensed by a company called Cellmedica, um, but there's certainly it, um, more enthusiasm uh, for this product as in the off the shelf setting. But how do we expand this to solid tumors that are not um, expressing viral antigens like EBV or HPV? And, and that's where we sort of really looked at learning from the TILs for melanoma and really trying to pick out uh, the uh, T cells that we want to target and just give them. And so now um, we can, using overlapping peptides, um, so these are uh, 15 amino acid lone peptides chopped up by 11 amino acids, um, uh, sorry, overlapping by uh, uh, 11 amino acids. You can dial up, if you like, whatever tumor antigen of choice you have. And so with this study that we evaluated in solid tumors and predominantly pediatric solid tumors, we targeted WT1, Prime, and Survivin. So we used dendritic cell pulses with uh, these overlapping peptide pools with two or sometimes three um, stimulations to expand a multi TAA specific T cell population. So this was a study that was led by Amy Hont and Holly Meany in our group, published a couple of years ago now. Um, the majority of the patients were pediatric with um, solid tumors such as sarcomas, neuroblastoma, and Wilms tumor. There was an older patient in her 50s with a soft tissue sarcoma, um, but the majority, as I said, were in the pediatric adolescent young adult range. Um, so despite these multiply, as you see here, they've re um, all received multiple lines of other therapies, um, we did see some durable responses, although not you know, resist criteria, um, objective responses, but these prolonged um, disease stabilizations, which in particular um, did seem to be uh, showing improved progression-free survival after the T-cell therapy compared to the patient's previous therapy. And remembering that, again, we did not give these T-cells in the setting of prescribed lymphodepletion or um, IL-2, so not mimicking exactly what um, the TIL protocol was, um, but giving a product where we knew um, the specificity uh, of, the, of the product. Um, we did look retrospectively in the patient's uh, own tumors to see if they um, did express the antigens we were targeting, and in the majority they did, and we could not correlate um, response with a degree of um, positivity of the tumor, but this is probably because of low um, patient number, uh, small sample size. However, we did, like we saw in the EBV setting, see this concept of antigen spreading. And um, so in the responding patients, we saw expansion to, of uh, T cells targeting other tumor associated antigens, as you can see here. Um, so antigens not expressed, um, not targeted by the T cell product. And this is an example here of a patient who had a dramatic antigen spreading response, and that correlated with a dramatic expansion of uh, T cells in the peripheral blood that we believe came from the product uh, because this is using TCR sequencing and we're looking at T, um, T cell clones that were present in the product but not present in the pre-infusion sample but expanded um, post-infusion. So we certainly saw a very safe um, 
safety profile. Again, we weren't giving it with prescribed lymphodepletion. Um, and yet we still saw this antigen spreading response um, that we, uh, you know, still hypothesizing could um, be important for disease response. So currently where we're at with this is really exploring, you know, combination therapies given the remarkable safety of this product. So we currently have amended the um, solid tumor protocol and are now giving these cells with prescribed lymphodepletion. We've just completed two studies that we just published in hematologic cancers, AML and Hodgkin lymphoma, uh, combining this product with demethylating agents to upregulate the expression of these antigens in vivo and with checkpoint inhibitors to obviously overcome T cell exhaustion in vivo. But <clears throat> Obviously, there are many um, other ways that tumors evade the immune response. And so I've talked about antigen loss and how we're overcoming that by targeting multiple antigens. Um, but also um, there is, um, you know, PD-1 um, and other checkpoint inhibitors. But I was also um, very interested in TGF-beta because it's so ubiquitously expressed by most uh, human cancers and employed as a potent tumor immune evasion strategy in these cancers. So can we render our cell therapies resistant to TGF-beta? Um, so certainly um, TGF-beta has devastating effects on T cells, not only their ability to proliferate, but on their cytolytic um, activity. And um, so in the very early days, actually early 2000s, uh, we um, gene engineered into a retroviral vector, a dominant negative receptor. We actually obtained the original one from Joanne Massagay and at Sloan Kettering. Uh, basically, there's a stop codon introduced after the uh, transmembrane domain of the, um, the wild type receptor. So what happens is you have um, uh, ligand binding, but no downstream signaling. So in other words here, um, you would normally on ligand binding have phosphorylation of your SMADs, which then lead to um, uh, gene uh, signaling, but uh, in the dominant negative receptor setting, uh, you do not get this downstream effects. And in particular, uh, it's truncated. So there's not, not even a phosphorylation of the SMADs. So we um, initially gene engineered our LMP T cell product with these uh, this retroviral vector expressing uh, the dominant negative uh, TGF beta receptor. Uh, these cells were highly transduced um, with the uh, DNR, and um, we did not see. Uh, phosphorylation of SMAD2 in these cells when you added exogenous TGF-beta, unlike the mock uh, transduced T cells. So um, furthermore, we were able to show that um, these cells uh, still proliferated in the presence of exogenous TGF-beta and also in the presence of supernatant uh, from, um, uh, in this case, Hodgkin lymphoma supernatant, which we know is TGF-beta rich. So we went on and treated um, eight patients on this study, all with relapsed refractory Hodgkin lymphoma, all refused additional chemotherapy. So all these patients received uh, the uh, T cells without prescribed lymphodepletion. And we, despite that, we still saw um, expansion and um, persistence um, of these uh, gene engineered T cells, uh, which correlated with um, clinical uh, re radiologic responses by resist criteria as shown in this patient and in this patient here. And in both of those patients, they've had a durable, complete remission for well over seven years with uh, detectable T cells. So overall, there were clinical responses, um, but you know, Hodgkin's is a busy space. So we decided to you know, further this technology uh, in the solid tumor setting. And actually, Laszlo and I had a grant together back uh, when we were at MD Anderson and Baylor uh, using DNR transduced TILs. 
And we are certainly exploring DNR transduce, TAAT. But we were also interested in broadening the applicability to NK cells. And um, so I just want to talk in the last few minutes about um, NK cells and why we um, wanted to use those, um, mainly because, you know, they don't need to recognize uh, tumors in the context of MHC. And there's been a remarkably good safety track record of the use of, of NK cells as an off-the-shelf therapeutic. So this was back in the day um, when I was collaborating with EJ Spall, who was from MD Anderson. We actually used cord blood as a donor source for NK cells to, um, as our platform. So based on that, this was work done by Rachel Berger when she was a grad student in my lab. We looked to see if we could gene engineer cord blood derived NK cells um, with our dominant negative TGF beta receptor, um, looking at um, pediatric cancers such as neuroblastoma and medulloblastoma. So we showed um, in the medulloblastoma setting in vitro that these uh, NK cells that were transduced with um, the dominant negative receptor uh, in the presence of TGF beta, the non transduced T um, NK cells have impaired cytolytic activity, but the um, transduced NK cells have no decrease in cytolytic activity in the presence of TGF beta. Furthermore, they, these um, TGF beta resistant NK cells actually act as a sink uh, for TGF beta in, the, um, in vitro, which would, could be um, of potential interest in vivo. So we also wanted to see if we could go one step better by turning the TGF beta negative single signal into a positive signal. So we added a DAP12 signaling domain here. Um, and so now what happens on ligand binding is you now get signaling through DAP12 to then get NK cell activation. So Rachel showed that she could um, transduce um, these uh, NK cells now with this activating receptor as well as the dominant negative receptor. And, um, and she showed that the activating receptor does um, have uh, these activating properties with phospho-AKT uh, showing increased uh, in the presence of TGF beta unlike obviously the dominant negative receptor um, transduced in K cells. Moreover, the, um, while the dominant negative receptor transduced NK cells do perform pretty well uh, in a neuroblastoma model, um, the activating receptor transduced um, NK cells perform better. And this is related to improved persistence of that uh, NK cell product transduced with the activating receptor versus the dominant negative receptor. So that's, um, we're, we're looking at taking this um, approach to the clinic in um, neuroblastoma and medulloblastoma, but we also were lucky enough to get funding, uh, moonshot funding to see if we can expand this to the um, glioblastoma multiforme space. So this um, is in collaboration with Barbara Savoldo from UNC, who had been looking at B7H3 as a target for GBM because of its, um, this, its fact that it is highly expressed in GBM and is correlated with a poor um, um, prognosis. They had shown that in um, a B7H3 CAR T cell product is potent in preclinical GBM models. So we wanted to see if we could um, transduce with the same CAR uh, in, in an NK cell model. So here, this is work that's uh, still unpublished, but in revision and Kajal Chowdhury from my group just recently presented it uh, at ISCT. Uh, showing that we can obviously highly transduce the car, the NK cells with this B7H3 car that was developed at UNC. Um, and not unexpectedly, the car transduced NK cells kill um, cell lines, uh, GBM cell lines, much more superiorly to non transduced NK cells. 
Um, furthermore, we actually have um, pediatric, um, so then, sorry, and then so, but these CAR NK cells, however, are um, susceptible still to TGF beta. So in the presence of TGF beta, their ability to kill the target does go down significantly. So gene engineering per se is not sufficient to rescue these cells from the effects of TGF beta. And so you can see here also you get downregulation of the activating receptor in KG2D uh, in the presence of TGF beta and DNAM as well. So Kajal went on then to actually double transduce the uh, NK cells with the B7H3CAR and the do do dominant negative um, receptor. Um, so she's now got a, a DNR NK uh, CAR in K cell. And you can see here, she can very effectively double transduce these NK cell products with both the CAR and the DNR. So what happens in the untransduced NK cells, not surprisingly, you get um, downstream signaling of, uh, with phospho-SMAD in the presence of TGF-beta. Same with the CAR, CAR NK cells, but now with the DNR NK cells and the DNR CAR NK cells, there's no downstream signaling. What does that mean functionally? So in the untransduced and the CAR transduced, you get downregulation of the activating receptors such as NKG2D, but in the DNR NK and the double transduced NK, you do not. Furthermore, we can see the same with DNAM and uh, CD16 that you again see preservation in the double transduced or the DNR transduced NK cells. So that also translates to um, poor um, killing, obviously, in the um, untransduced or the CAR transduced NK cells, but now you have preservation of the cytolytic activity in the DNR NK cells and actually increased cytolytic activity in the double transduced NK cells. So these are my last few slides um, that you know, we really are now showing that you can double transduce these off the shelf in K cells. Um, they can um, uh, be effectively can rescue this, the poor cytolytic activity that NK cells usually have in the presence of TGF beta. And so we're currently evaluating this in vivo, but it's really providing a proof of principle for off the shelf NK cell therapies for brain tumors and other solid tumors. So I'm just going to skip um, the last couple of slides. You know, I do want to just leave with the fact that it is a new dawn for cell therapy. And I think we do have a lot of horizons uh, uh, out there for cell therapy for uh, solid tumors. But, you know, what do we need to get wider applicability? And, you know, we do need to show that these products are safe. Ideally, if we can have one platform that's for many diseases, we need these products to be cheaper and more transportable, and they need to be safe because we are highly scrutinized as a, as a community. So this is my sort of vision for where I think we can end up for solid tumors, um, that we have um, debulking um, surgery or um, other strategies, targeted strategies, um, and then come in with our complex biologics at a time of more minimal residual disease, target the so-called cancer stem cell and the chemo-resistant cells and affect a cure. So thank you very much. Sorry, I'm, I may have gone a few, um, over time and thank you very much for and acknowledging my entire team. It certainly does take a village. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bolan. And um, I'd like to still encourage the audience to, um, I will see some, you know, a few questions coming in. If you have questions for Dr. Bolan, please type it in the Q&A and we will, um, take all the questions after um, the next presentation. So right now, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Nick Timmins. Dr. Timmins is a, um, the Chief Development Officer of Artisan Bio. Artisan Bio is a cell therapy company, it's also a J-Labs company. And Tim is, um, Nick is sort of a J-Labs veteran because he also 
had the experience at Blue Rock Therapeutics, which is another Toronto area cell therapy company. But um, today, without further ado, Nick will be talking to us about their approach to um, solid tumors within Artisan Bio. Thank you very much, Dozy. Uh, great pleasure to be here. Thanks everybody for joining and thank you to JLabs and OICR for this opportunity to present. You can see the title there, Solid Solutions, uh, which obviously alludes to the corresponding challenges of dealing with solid tumors. I am gonna take just one slide to talk about what and who Artisan Bio is. Uh, what we are is we're a cell engineering uh, powerhouse that really is here to drive the cell therapy revolution. There's a lot of potential in the space. There's a lot of work to be done and a lot of opportunity. In our case, what we have is a uh, CRISPR engineering platform that we call Star CRISPR, uh, which is shown briefly down here. This gives us a differentiated IP position. We sort of sit outside the, the patent warfare that goes on around the, what I guess you could term at this point, the classical CRISPRs. That comprises 12 patent families with claims covering nucleases, guides, targets, and safe harbors. That platform allows us to deliver very high precision editing. Um, we can routinely achieve knockout efficiencies uh, over 99%. Uh, we have a low off-target events and we can also work across multiple cell types. The platform itself is, is highly multiplexable. Uh, we can edit multiple things at the same time. We can deliver large inserts. So think things like jewel cars, for example. We have novel enhancers that we can add into the mix there and an approach for high performance guide discovery. So in identifying new gene targets, but also um, optimizing pre-identified gene targets as well. Our system is also tunable, so we can modulate the on-target and the off-target activity, and we can upgrade the performance to work with hard targets. So one example I can think of started off at around about a 10 to 15 percent knockout. Now we're return routinely up above that 90 percent uh, phase there. We also have a proven team with extensive technical capabilities and technical uh, and industry experience. And you can see up the top right there, our CEO and co-founder Ryan Gill has a long history in synthetic biology. He's a serial entrepreneur. Um, his company before Artisan Bio was in Scripta, which is a pretty big deal in the gene writing space at the moment. And he's also a co-founder of the MAD7 Nuclease, uh, for those who are familiar with it. Tanya Warnicki, our CTO and other co-founder, uh, also a co-founder of Inscriptor and co-inventor of MAD7, a long history in the um, cell engineering and synthetic biology space. Uh, over here, you have me in my pre-bearded days. As Dozy mentioned, I was at Blue Rock Therapeutics. Uh, also for the Ontario audience, I spent 2011 to I think about 2017 at CCRM, where I built and led the majority of their technical capabilities and sort of overall have about 18 odd years in the cell and gene therapy space. What we are really about, did I advance too far? No. Uh, what we're really about, however, of course, is, is patients. How do we deliver better outcomes for patients with these horrible diseases, in this case, focusing around cancer? And these are the faces of just a few people, and in some cases, some of their family members, um, who were lucky enough to receive CAR-T treatments back in the early days when these were highly experimental therapies. And by and large, these people had essentially been given their death notices. They were not expected to live much longer. They failed multiple rounds of therapies. Um, and these were ultimately highly successful. Uh, you can see down here, uh, um, Emily Whitehead is now actually 10 years cancer-free. Uh, I put this slide together two years ago, uh, hence the eight years. And uh, another Emily, Emily Dummler here, who is actually a personal friend of our chief technology officer as well. So this tends to be what we talk about in the world of CAR-T and just how effective and uh, how important they are. And that is very true, but there is also a reality to be recognized here. Uh, first off, it's true for only a small but growing selection of hematological cancers. And even in that context, by and large, there's a pretty high relapse rate, which often doesn't get talked about so much. Uh, you could sort of generalize and say it's north of 50%. It can actually be quite a bit higher than that. Again, this is an improving. Uh, J&J's recently approved Carvecti, for example. It is, appears to be performing much better than that. 
Uh, these treatments are currently also exceedingly expensive, 350 to 475K for the drug, uh, and that's US dollars as well. And it's estimated that the total cost of treatment for a CAR-T therapy is around one and a half to two million US dollars. So again, a number that often doesn't really get talked about so much. The final bullet point there, you need to be well enough after multiple rounds of failed treatments, for instance, harsh chemotherapy, these kinds of things, you still have to have enough T cells that haven't been completely beaten to a pulp so that you can then manufacture the drug product for that. I think that the biggest uh, issue to sort of address here really is this aspect of them currently being focused around the hematological indications. So what I'm showing here is really to get across the point that solid tumors account for the vast majority of all of the cancers out there. So this graph is showing you the disease burden rates by cancer types in terms of DALIs or disability adjusted life years per 100,000 individuals. And when we try and find hematological cancers in this graph, they're here. Uh, the bottom arrow there is non-Hodgkin's. All the other hematological indications are presumably lumped into other malignant neoplasms. So for all that it's an important patient population and CAR-T are an incredibly powerful drug, there is most definitely a much bigger issue that we need to be addressing. So that brings me to the question, well, what is the problem with solid tumors? What are we actually dealing with? So let's think about the journey of a uh, engineered immune cell therapy. It could be a CAR-T, it could be a TCR, it could be an NK, it, it could be whatever. Just think of it as a tumor killing immune cell therapy. And that is sitting here in its infusion bag. It's gonna travel down the line under the current paradigm at least. Uh, it's going via peripheral infusion. It's going to spread through the body and gets disseminated all over the place. And you're hoping that some fraction, uh, preferably a preponderance of those cells, is actually going to find it way, its way to the location of the tumor. Okay, So our cells get to the tumor. They go through the microvasculature. They have to get out of the microvasculature into the, the tumor itself, where we've got a mix of all sorts of cells. We've got cancer cells. We've got stroma. We've got immune cells. There's a lot going on in here. And as you progress away from the vasculature, you move into a, um, a rough representation here, the gradient reflecting an increasingly hostile microenvironment. pH drops, uh, O2 drops to the point of disappearing. There's decreased availability of nutrients. It's hard to stay alive and active in these environments. And in parallel to all this, the cells that are in this mass here are also secreting a mixture of both anti and pro-tumor uh, signaling molecules, which are going to impact the phenotype and performance of your therapeutic cell that you've put in there. So looking at this another way, you can kind of think about it a little bit algorithmically. So I'll, I'll come to that in, in a moment. First of all, I want to highlight this part here. These drugs, to really realize their potential, they're going to need to be affordable. They're going to need to be accessible. I.e., You need to be in a jurisdiction where um, they have been approved and they need to be available. So for instance, uh, if you have just gone through all your rounds of chemotherapy and you're running into that problem of not being well enough, it would not be available. So first off, you need the AAA drug product. Algorithmically, your cells have to do and not do certain things. So this diagram assumes an allogeneic uh, cell therapy, and I'll come to that on the next slide as to why that might be a good idea. So in an allo context, you hit, the, you hit the recipient's uh, bloodstream and you have to, first of all, avoid the recipient immune system and simultaneously don't attack the recipient. Uh, that would be bad. And you also have to not attack the target cells. You then have to survive in circulation. You have to find the tumor sites and you've also got to stay active once you find the tumor site. And in the current paradigm, again, at the moment, you'd be wanting to get some proliferation in there. So once you're in the tumor and you're staying active, you have to find and then very explicitly identify the target cells. You want to penetrate into the tumor. You have to keep surviving in the tumor and you have to find all of the target cells. Maybe they're metastases. Maybe they're just hidden in some deep inaccessible region of the primary tumor site. If you don't clear them all out, relapse is likely to be a problem. And of course, while you're in this uh, zone of the, of the algorithm, you have to kill the target cells you are ideally activating the host immune system. 
And you are also being careful not to overdo it because if you overdo it, then you're going to run into the issues of cytokine release syndromes and, and potentially neurotoxicities and this kind of thing. So what I'm going to go through on the next few slides is the boxes uh, in green here and in terms of what Artisan is doing to address some of these challenges. So first of all, the affordable, accessible and available cell therapies and the story about why um, allogeneic cells might be a good idea. Here's the rough estimate of the cost of current generation autologous CAR T cells. So there is some variability in this. It depends on exactly who the manufacturer is, for example, but it's somewhere in the range of $100,000. In some cases, it's a lot more. In some cases, a little bit less. You can find this in the literature and you will hear the manufacturers talking about these kinds of numbers. When you move to a non-viral and allogeneic approach, you can see a very dramatic drop in the cost. This first one is assuming an allogeneic uh, CAR X, so not specifying that it's a T cell or an NK cell at this point, for example, uh, and assuming that it's got about a 30% efficiency of, of CAR insertion. So you can model out the numbers to come in um, down around here. I think this was around about uh, five or $6,000. If you can double the efficiency of the car insertion, you get twice as many doses per batch you make, so you effectively half the cost. If you move to an IPSC setting, um, you're somewhere in a similar range here. Uh, this is sitting around, let's call it two and a half to, to five thousand dollars per dose of the cost of goods. So this is, for example, where Fate uh, would be expected to be sitting with its uh, IPSC-derived NK products. And at Artisan, we're also looking at what the next, next generation might actually look like. And there is approaches there where we believe it's possible to get those prices down to under $500 per dose on cost of goods. The diagrams down the bottom here, I'm not going to speak to them. Um, I could ad nauseum because it's my bread and butter, but I'll spare you the pain. Just trying to highlight here the importance of manufacturing approaches. And no matter how good things might behave clinically, um, how fantastic the outcomes, if you can't manufacture the stuff, if you can't make it and turn it into a drug product, you're not going to reach people with it. So there's um, approaches to doing that in a very robust and thorough ways. Um, quality by design concept, which is kind of outlined down the bottom here. If you want to learn more, you can go and look at this article, which I was fortunate enough to be a, a co-author on. And the figure over here is trying to draw that out from a quality by design concept, how we can actually use cell engineering to further enhance that. So it's not just about how do we engineer ourselves for therapeutic efficacy, but how can we also engineer ourselves for better quality, uh, lower risk and better manufacturability as well. So moving down uh, the, uh, sorry, entering the, the flow chart of the algorithm, we had this issue of don't attack the recipient and avoid attack by recipient. So one of the approaches we're pursuing in the T cell context here is first of all, to knock out the, the TCR to prevent attack of the host and to, of the recipient, sorry, and to avoid uh, recipient attack of the drug product, we are knocking out the HLAs. So over here in this figure, you have the percent of positive cells for TCR, HLA-1 and HLA-2. This is uh, control cells, which have been electroporated because our technology is non-viral. We deliver by electroporation. And so those molecules are being expressed. And when we do the knockouts, uh, two different conditions here, you can see we get a very substantial knockout in the expression of those molecules. Representative flow plots up here are what you'd expect given what the bar charts show. And down here, just showing conceptually what is happening. So the knockout of the TCRs to prevent the therapeutic cell recognition of the host cells and the knockout of the HLAs is to prevent the host recognition of the foreign CAR T cells. Moving along, we have this issue of find a tumor and then kill the target cells. So there is also an unexpected theme here, um, talking about a B7H3 targeting CAR. Uh, so it's not just the accents, that's the theme of the day. And the CXCR2 ex co-expression there, CXCR2 being the receptor for IL-8 and IL-8 being highly overexpressed in a number of tumors. So in vitro, here we have um, the B7H3 CAR ex only expressing cells sitting in the bottom of a well near a source of IL-8. 
and they just kind of sit there on the bottom and don't do anything. When we add the CXCR2, you can see that those cells migrate away from the bottom of the cell and go elsewhere so that the um, confluency is reducing over time. And this is uh, data collected um, from Michael Vernieris' lab at the University of Colorado, who we're partnered with on this, and that B7H3CXCR2 construct is something we've licensed in from there. On the right-hand side, in vitro data again, uh, looking at the impact of these of the B7H3 targeting. So this is B7H3 car expressing cells um, down here in contact with B7H3 expressing antigen expressing target cells, and here is without the car. So in the in the absence of of the car, you can see the target cells grow happily; they increase over time. You add in the car and not only do these cells not grow, they die over time. This looks far more impressive in vivo. Now, what we have here is uh, mice, sarcoma bearing mice who have been given control T cells and sarcoma bearing mice that have been given B7H3 CAR T cells. And you can see there's effectively no difference. Uh, these mice die and they die at roughly the same amount of time. You give the, the, the dual construct now, so the CXCR2 has been co-expressed here, and you can see the dramatic clearance of that tumour, and that's exemplified even more over here on the growth curve with those mice running out to 100 days and beyond with survival. So when you start thinking about how do you translate this to a drug, how do we edit all these things? Um, one approach to doing that is, is potentially multiplexing all those edits together. That's what this is showing here. So this graph now is the, on the y-axis is the percent cells that are TCR negative, HLA1 negative, HLA2 negative, B7H3 positive and CXCR2 positive. So it's a bit of a mouthful, but it's kind of like that complete cell build and you can see our control cells, uh, unsurprisingly, there are none of them that have that combined phenotype. Two different processes here, and you can see pushing up above 30% uh, in, in this one and around 30% here. The knockouts are well north of this. These are pushing well above the 90% uh, generally. The, the limiting factor here tends to be the car insertion, um, but that also in a number of cases, we're able to push that up more to that 60% level that I referred to on the cost slide. And that cell build then is depicted here. Some of the things that we can you know, do here is the multiplex editing to knock these things out for the allo side of things. The precision insertion of a car, in this case, coupled with the CXCR2. And I can't actually see or remember what's here because I have a little panel in my way, but I'll let you guys read that for yourself. And then finally, uh, recognition of the team. So I showed the leadership earlier. Uh, obviously, it's about the company as a whole and the team we have. This is just a few of the faces of our team members. I want to mention I've been particularly fortunate based in Toronto to be able to go and cherry pick um, what I consider to be some of the, the best people around to help drive this forward. So a shout out to my team in Toronto, but also a shout out to the, the full artisan team I think we're something special. I think we can really make a difference here. And with that, thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Nick. That was that was awesome. So um, I'll be bringing up the rest of the panel now. And please, if you have questions for Nick or for Dr. Bullard, please um, type it in the Q&A. So Laura Johnson is one of our panelists. And um, Laura is a... Um, you know, when, when Dr. Bullard was talking, she talked about the tail in melanoma. So Laura has had front seat of cell therapy development, both at Dr. Rosenberg's lab, but also at UPenn. So it's um, currently, she's the chief scientific officer of Verizon Therapeutics, and we've seen a lot with cell therapy. So we're so privileged to have you here today, Laura. Thank you, Dozy. Our next panelist is Jonathan Bramson. Um, Jonathan is the Vice Dean of, um, of Research at the uh, Faculty of Health at the uh, McMaster University. He also holds a John Bernstein Chair there and um, is a researcher in cell therapy, trying to understand um, how to um, 
reimagine white blood cells to go after cancer cells. So we have a quite a steam panel today and um, we would just kick it right off right now. Welcome, Jonathan. Sorry, I thought the camera was on. <laughs> That's good. Thank you, it's good to see you all. Okay, so we'll kick it off with, um, first of all, for, you know, for our panelists who the audience haven't got a chance to hear, I'll go to you first, Laura. As somebody who's had a front seat with all the um, development of these therapies from you know, for the last 20 or so years, um, there is now a feeling that um, cell therapies for solid tumors are not that effective. And um, what is the truth and what is the myth? And maybe you can also reflect on what you heard from our speakers today, if you think you vehemently disagree with. <laughs> Sure. Thanks, Dozy. Um, yeah, it, thanks for alluding back to the uh, the old days with uh, the metastatic melanoma. Uh, and it took me aback when you said 20 years, and it really has been 20 years now. Time flies. Uh, yeah, I was very fortunate to be involved originally in Steve Rosenberg's team. Uh, I did my postdoctorate research there uh, when the TIL therapy had taken off, trying to do some TCR engineered T cell therapy for patients with metastatic melanoma. And, uh, you know, that, that's where somewhere that uh, whenever I hear the term, you know, cell therapy doesn't work for solid tumors, um, I beg to disagree. Uh, it certainly can work. And, you know, that, that's what really set my path on my career after that was being able to sit there and walk through, you know, as a PhD immunologist, the clinical center there and see these patients receiving the cell therapies and then literally watching pounds of tumor melt away. Uh, and uh, I know, I believe uh, Laszlo put up some of those pictures where you can see within 12 days, you could actually see large, large tumors just disappearing from these patients. Um, and it's been some time since then, it's been almost 20 years. And it's very true. We haven't really seen the big advances and the big sort of eureka moments that we've seen with hematologic malignancies uh, like Kim Raya and Yaskarta, um, which by the way, just uh, in, in case some people aren't aware, Yaskarta actually ended up being a spinoff from Steve Rosenberg's team uh, where they did the, uh, Jim Kokendorfer did the original CD19 CAR T that became Kite, that became Gilead. Um, and we just don't see that in solid tumors and they work, the cells work, you know, they work in a dish, they work in a mouse model, you put them into patients and you do see those tumors shrink. You see the cells that get into the tumors. People used to think that would be a problem. You see them activating in the tumors, attacking the antigens. People used to think that would be a problem. Um, they're there, they even survive long-term in many cases but the tumors come back or they don't go away. And I think that is the real sticking point now. Um, thankfully, I would say in about the last five to six years, there've been a number of very, very brilliant scientists, researchers around the globe who have all come up with different uh, answers that all seem to point to a very similar uh, molecular mechanism by which these things fail. Uh, and it seems like initially they work, but then something happens and the T cells stop working in the tumor. So I think that's really where a lot of groups are looking now and trying to move past that point. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you for offering that perspective. Um, I'll go to you, Dr. Bramson, um, as somebody who studies cell therapy and um, you know, trying to understand the mechanisms and so forth. Um, are there any insights you can share for us into the mechanisms that relate to what Laura just talked about, that sometimes these things work and sometimes they don't work? Are there things that are known right now that you can share with us of the areas of active research trying to understand that? You know, if, if, if I had to answer that question, <laughs> uh, I'd have solved the problem. I, I think that, that Dr. Ballard pointed out TGF beta is a major concern and, you know, barring some of the toxicities that seem to be manifesting in some cases with TGF beta knockout cells, um, that may be a fruitful path to go down. I, I suspect the bigger issue is that we just got lucky in heme 
and we got a handful of really good targets and we knocked out a bunch of cells um, and we don't have equally good targets in solid tumors or even in many heme malignancies. And so we have this false impression that it doesn't work when actually we think we're so smart that we got it right the first time. We didn't. It just happens to be that CD19, CD20, BCMA, um, you know, even CD30, these, these, are, these are targets that have good toxicity profiles. So we can push the cells in and we can manage the patients when they, when they observe tox. I haven't seen equally good targets in solid tumors. And so I, I think that's part of it. You know, everyone nowadays wants a home run in your phase one study. We've, we've ignored all realities of clinical trials methodology, which is first prove toxicity and safety and then address the efficacy because we've been getting lucky. So we've been seeing some good responses. And then we just assume that, well, if you don't get a response in the first 10 patients, toss it out and go to the next thing. Um, I, you know, that's flawed science, I would say. So, you know, the other reality is we're now seeing studies coming out with CAR T-cells and other T-cell therapies, uh, engineered TCRs, et cetera, where we are seeing activity in solid tumors. So some of the myths are being busted in front of us as we get better targets. Um, you know, is, is that going to overcome some of the points that Laura raised as far as relapse? I, I don't know. I, I, it, it's, it's early days and, uh, you know, <laughs> We're too quick to judge on too little data uh, about efficacy. So I guess that'd be my comment: is that there's enough evidence out there, and you know, Laura raised the till evidence, which is excellent, to show that when you get the right targets and you got the right treatment regimen, you can see tumors melt away. So we need to recognize that tumors and cancer are incredibly heterogeneous. You know, we lump them into disease sites because it's convenient, but even within those disease sites, there's huge heterogeneity. And until we unlock some of that heterogeneity, we're not going to see the kind of efficacy we're seeing with the heme malignancies. But I don't believe it's actually a barrier. I, I think it's just it's a reflection of the true complexity. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And I'll come back to the um, target question if, if um, time permits. Um, I'll go to you, Dr. Bollard, before I go to some of the audience questions now. Um, and the some of the going off of some of what Jonathan said now, which is that um, We've seen uh, flashes of success in limited settings, let's call it that, melanoma and some of these. It, it occurred to me while you were going through your talk that things like melanoma, some of the pediatric tumors, neuroblastoma and so forth, may be different from things like pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, or things like that, because I haven't seen that much data in that space. Question is, are they truly different, basically, through epithelial solid tumors, are they different from these things that have their origin in mesenchymal stem cells? And is there anything known about differences and what those might be and what they might mean for cell therapy in solid tumors? I mean, I definitely think you're, you're right that there are fundamental differences um, that make, you know, these sort of cell, you know, tumors like some of these pediatric cancers um, and melanoma more receptive to, to immunotherapies. I mean, even if we look at the EBV setting, you know, EBV T cell therapies have really not been great for nasopharyngeal carcinoma and other EBV positive solid tumors. So, you know, that just shows you that the cell of origin really probably is important as a target. And, um, you know, I, we don't know enough yet. I mean, I think as T cell therapists and cell therapists, we're focused more on the product and less on the tumor. And I think we do need as a group, you know, to work together with cancer biologists to figure out what's happening on the tumor side and what tumors are going to be more amenable to cell therapy attack uh, than others and how do we overcome it. Thank you. So I'll take a few of the audience questions here, quite a few of them now. Um, so this is for Dr. Bollard. What is the basis of basis for the tumor specificity of DNR and K cells in neuroblastoma model? Is it related to loss of MHC class one? Yeah, so that's that's the theory. And certainly um, there's been work that was done at Sloan Kettering showing there is a inherent in K cell effect. Uh, in neuroblastoma, most likely due to uh, downregulation of MHC class one, as well as um, different uh, care profiles of, of permissive tumors. So, 
Um, that was why we chose that as a target, because we knew that there was this um, NK cell effect seeing in the post autograft setting. So, yeah. Thank you. There's another question. Maybe I'll go to you with this one, Nick. Um, what are the principal bottlenecks of cell therapy in solid tumors as against using a mix of tumor regressive mRNAs that may be able to penetrate and accumulate within the tumors? And if that's clear. Yeah, I have to admit, I'm not entirely sure how to answer that question because we don't know what the answer is in either case yet. Um, there, so on a, on a biological basis, I would say we don't know what the answer is in general. Um, we've got hints, so we don't know modality-wise which thing is going to win out. I can speak to it more on a manufacturing perspective because it's obviously a lot easier to make mRNAs than it, than it is to make complex cells. Um, so that kind of comes back to how do you how do you engineer the cells with the required quantity and quality and expand those up? And this comes very much down to the 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 process platforms and approach you take. It, it's simply these are complex living organisms. Um, they respond to a lot of stuff and they remember what you've done to them. And so at the moment, our manufacturing platforms have a long way to evolve. Uh, they have the benefit of engineering in the right way. They can find their own way. You talk about the mRNAs, then you have the flip side of delivery challenges. Alan Pease have obviously had a lot of success uh, thanks to COVID. They're increasingly having success in in vivo gene therapies, uh, particularly if you're targeting the liver. But so far, trying to target heterogeneous cancers in various locations in the body, um, you have a different bottleneck now around the targeting as opposed to the manufacturing. Maybe someone else can speak to the, the biological efficacy um, where I can't so much. Thank you, Nick. Does any of the other panelists want to weigh in on that? Okay, Laura, please. Thanks, Dozy. Just had to find the mute button. Um, yeah, that's it's it's such an important question. I think there's the two halves, the uh, the, the two halves of the synapse, really, the uh, the effector cells, usually the T cells, and then the tumor, uh, and so many different ways of shutting down the immune system. Uh, it's it's funny, you know. I'm, I'm at heart an immunologist. You know, I sort of live and breathe that, and you know, the body's first purpose has evolved not to harm yourself. And the problem with tumors really is that they are derived from self. They are self. So just about anything that we can think up to target against tumors involving your immune system, your body's already evolved a hundred different ways to shut it down and turn it off. Uh, I, I do know there's been a number of different groups. Uh, I was, uh, I was fortunate to, to be able uh, to see at a conference earlier this year, uh, Crystal Makel, uh, used to be NCI, she's now at Stanford, uh, discovered a potential pathway by which some solid tumors at least are resisting cell therapy, CAR cell therapy, TCR cell therapy. Uh, and really it seems to be that when we put these CARs in, you know, although they're derived from a natural concept of signaling, they eventually exhaust the T cell because ultimately they are forcing it to activate. And the structure is artificial enough that it causes a constitutive low level activation, which seems to make it that the T cell can never really rest and recover to be able to have these multiple hits that you'll see in the tumor solid environment in particular. Well, you'll they may destroy some tumor cells, but then there will be more and more and more constantly coming for them. Uh, so I think that is definitely numerous groups now, you know, both academic and in industry are looking at different ways to circumvent that, uh, starting with, say, earlier uh, T cells. I think uh, Laszlo touched on that as well, starting with, you know, a very, very early sort of naive like T cell so that it has more to go before it becomes exhausted. Uh, split signaling uh, is something that the the group that I'm with now, Verismo, a spinoff from Penn, is looking at splitting the signal so that once the target is no longer bound, the cell can rest back down and recover. Um, 
multiple different avenues, but all sort of leading to the same ultimate mechanism, which I think is really nice. It just has yet to be shown if it's actually going to impact or not. Thank you. Any other panelists wanted to talk about that? Okay, thanks. Well, the next one is, um, I think some of you touched on it, but there's a question around from one of the attendees. Obviously, we see there's a need for solid tumor cell therapy. However, both Poseida and Timunity reported, I'm pausing because I know Laura is familiar with this, reported patient died with their CAR T product, and those companies are no longer appreciated by people. Both companies hinted macrophage activation being the cause. Do the panelists think this is an issue specifically for the two companies? or a generalized issue for solid tumor CAR T? And if it is the latter, is there any way to minimize risk to patients so that um, um, we will be safe? I guess I'll go to you first, Laura, <laughs> sorry. No worries, yes. Uh, for the audience that's not aware, I uh, was in the, uh, the Carl Junes group at the UPenn for uh, about five years recently when they were uh, manufacturing the original CD19 car that became Kimraya, and also when Timunity spun out of, uh, of Penn. They also are a Penn spinoff, as is Verismo. Um, I, I'm definitely aware of the, the fatalities that have happened in that and other trials, actually. Uh, I believe Etara recently had another one uh, at their, their trial at Memorial Sloan Kettering. There have been a number of groups. Each case seems to be different if you look very deeply into it. Um, you know, the macrophage activation syndrome that's discussed, that seems to be something that happens with particular targets. Um, just like say the CD19 targeting the hematologic malignancies was not without its fatalities, unfortunately, particularly before physicians and treaters learned how to expect this and address this with their uh, immune cell activated neurologic syndromes and cytokine release syndrome. Um, the the team immunity, you know, I, I don't know if the public's really turned on them. I still personally think they're a great company, but uh, I think that was very much a question of, uh, you know, in a, a stage one clinical trial, changing two variables at once. So it was uh, targeting, I believe the PSMA antigen, uh, and they had additionally put in, as uh, Dr. Ballard was talking about, the anti-TGF beta work. Um, they had one of those as well, uh, dominant negative TGF beta. So no one really knows clearly if it was maybe that the target wasn't good, um, as we just recently heard from the last uh, speaker, or if it was more of a case that the breaks were removed from the T cells. So it's, there's no simple answer, unfortunately, but I think each case needs to be taken independently. The Atara case, for example, targeted uh, mesothelin, which multiple groups have done, you know, not a lot successfully. There have been some signals, but at the same time, they released the breaks by genetically modifying the anti-PD-1. So it's, it's not really clear which is the cause, but I think Anytime you put something new in human for the first time, you just have to approach it very, very carefully. Thank you, Laura. Any other panelists want to talk about the um, um, safety in solid tumors? So, um, so one thing I will give a shout out, we're doing a um, CAR T cell workshop at ASGCT on Sunday, and there's a whole session on this. So you're more than welcome to come and attend that. Um, but, you know, it actually goes back to what I was talking about, you know, with where we have such a high bar put on us as a community if you think about what other agents cause cancer and you know I mean if this the drug world has a much lower bar put on them and you know we're treating patients who have exhausted all other therapeutic options and yes the immune system is really potent so there will be adverse events you know and so I think we need to put some of that into context and and work with the regulators on that as well. No, that's a really great point that um, some of these innovative therapies that are being developed literally under the bright shining lights um, are held to a different set of standards, it seems, than everything else. Yeah. Well, um, 
because Target came up with the um, with the safety conversation, and and, and Dr. Bramson, you talked about Target a little bit earlier on. Um, do you have any thoughts on the on the target strategies around solid tumor? Because you seem to suggest there are no good targets. Is it because we don't know, or we are not looking the right way? Yeah, I wouldn't say there's no good targets. I'd say it's all about the therapeutic index, right? We, I mean, we, we have an ongoing trial with HER2 targeted engineering T cell. There's no worse target than HER2 because it's expressed all over the body. Um, okay. But but it's about that delta, right? So it, it, it's about that differential uh, expression. And um, sorry, I didn't mean to suggest that the solid tumor targets are no good. I'm simply saying that they're not necessarily as good as, as the few liquid tumor targets that we found that really are very uniquely expressed for the most part on liquid tumors. So, um, you know, folks continue to publish new targets uh, and, and maybe some of those targets will be better, but then someone else finds them somewhere else in the body. It's hard to imagine something that's been uniquely expressed in the tumor and isn't expressed anywhere else in the world. So I, I don't think it's what we should be aiming for. We should be aiming for that therapeutic index. What, what target has an acceptable tolerability? And, you know, if we go back to the till story, because it's a good one, it's a salt tumor that melts away, sometimes you get vitiligo, but not all the time, which means that there must be some targets in there that allow for anti-tumor effect, but aren't sustained. Um, we also don't have autoimmunity, despite the fact that all of our T cells recognize our own MHC. So there's a phenomenal amount of peripheral regulation that goes on that limits T-cell function in the tissues. And that probably plays into this therapeutic index that would allow you to go after imperfect targets um, mm -hmm. because th the healthy tissues push back. So am I seeing the world with rose-colored glasses? Absolutely. I, I think there's phenomenal reason to be enthusiastic, but not unlike the early days of chemotherapy, to expect a magic bullet, I think, is a little bit un unrealistic, right? I mean, we would never have chemo drugs that currently allow people to have fantastic lives if we got scared every time someone got sick. I mean, nitrogen mustard drugs are horrible, right? But those are the ones that led, that led, led the charge. So I think we need to adjust our expectations. And it was great that we're so smart that we made up a C19 drug that leads to good responses and that we got lucky and picked a protein on a virus that gives rise to a nice mRNA vaccine. So yeah, scientists get lucky every now and then, but not typically. Typically, yeah. science takes a lot longer than that. So we have to just adjust expectations. Thank you. So Nick, there's a question for you. Have you experienced any limits to the degree of multiplex editing you can achieve with either T, NK, or IPSC? Um, no, because we haven't found the limit yet um, I'm, I'm sure there is we can multiplex up to eight different targets and get very high editing efficiency still still uh, there's an open question as to just what is going on genomically there uh, you, you're causing a lot of double-stranded breaks uh, simultaneously we know from the literature we know from observation that that can result in some unwanted events but what is the consequence of the unwanted event so if i just take a step back and talk generally about uh, CRISPR gene editing and potential off targets and this kind of thing you know the field gets very excited at times about oh what happens if you get an off target event the question is does that off target event actually matter and what are those consequences so um, in that context, we're not sure where the balance is. So for instance, how much do you multiplex versus how much do you edit in serial is an open question. And where is the balance there? And uh, there's a lot of effort going into building the analytical platforms first to identify that they've occurred, where they've occurred, and then ask that question, does it matter from a risk profile perspective? Thank you, Nick. There's a question here on DNA methylation, and the question is um, from Brooke. Would DNA methylation be partly responsible for the failure of cell therapies in solid tumors, just as in the case of standard chemo? And any of the panelists can take that, please. Anybody? <laughs> Sorry, say the question again. I guess I wasn't completely They're asking, I think, um, based whether DNA methylation would be responsible in part for the failure of um, cell therapies in solid tumors, as is the case for chemotherapy. 
I think so. I, I think so. I think, you know, that, um, well, certainly um, for the um, cancer expression of some of these antigens, definitely. Um, but, you know, bottom line is it's going to be multifactorial. I personally still think one of the big um, failures for TILs, for example, is MHC downregulation. Um, so I, every time I ask Steve Rosenberg about this, he says, oh, the interferon gamma at the tumor site will fix that. But <laughs> I don't think that does. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, but it's, it's really multifactorial. But the fact that the tumors do need so many different ways to evade, um, to me, means that we do sort of have a chance if we address at least some of them. So, but Thank yeah. Yeah, our time is running short. Great. So, um, Nick, this is a question for you, which I actually have, but the audience member had too. And our other panelists can chime in here too. So, um, you mentioned the cost of these therapies getting down to $500. I realize you were describing your vision for many years from now, but I'd like to hear your and other panelists' thoughts on making this an actuality. I think it gets to the point of manufacturing, really are there strategies today that could be used to reduce cost of manufacturing or the challenges associated with it? Great, great question. I need a moment to get on my soapbox for this one, so I just climb <laughs> up on there. Um, so let me use an analogy. Let's go back to monoclonal antibodies. Um, when they were first, first coming out, they were many, many thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of dollars to get those size quantities. Uh, today, you can make gram quantities of therapeutic GMP monoclonal antibodies for substantially under $100 per gram. And we are in that early stage of the monoclonal antibody days. And a lot of people will say, well, yes, but cells are way more complex than a monoclonal antibody. That is true. But when you look at the manufacturing, when you make a monoclonal antibody, you grow cells and most of the cost is in the downstream processing. When you do cell therapies, we don't do 98% of that downstream processing. So the biggest piece of the cost is gone. Uh, what it requires is work to in some regards, um, create a cell therapy equivalent of a CHO cell, for example, or various versions of it. It's got to be iteration. So what is, what is the biological platform that we're utilizing and how can we engineer our way towards that in concert with the actual process and manufacturing approaches we're utilizing as well? We've come from um, a very much a, an autologous type modality when you start moving into allo, you get economies of scale, you get much better process consistency. You can, you can really go to town on the optimization, um, but you and as long as you're always going back to um, some somewhat messy donor material along the way and you've got more variables to deal with, that optimization becomes increasingly challenging. So. I, I honestly think it is achievable and, and it may not be super far off. I mean, it's going to be a while before anything hits market for sure, but in terms of, of getting the, the evidence for it, it may not be so off. And I think we have the precedent for it. As I say, we're, we're very early on the same curve of where monoclonals were, um, but I don't think we'll take nearly as long to travel along that curve. It'll have the same shape, but it's, it should be a more compressed curve. At Thank least you. I hope so. Thank you, Nick. And I have one last question and it's one word answer for each of the panelists. Is there any clinical trial going on now in solid tumor that you're most curious or most excited to see the result of? Anyone go? I'll go first, my okay. trial. Okay, <laughs> that's easy. Anybody else? I can say the most uh, exciting translational research that I'm interested in, and it's not even my company that does it, uh, is the sort of direct to consumer using uh, lentivirus, retrovirus injected directly into the patient to make the CAR T cells in vivo. Okay. Most interested to see how that turns out. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, I agree. I mean, they're, they're sort of leveraging the mRNA technology from the sort of COVID vaccines to sort of in vivo cars. I think that will be fascinating. That's great. Well, 
Thank you all so much. And um, thank you so much, uh, panelists. And thank you, everybody, for hanging with us. I'll turn it back over to Laszlo to give us the final remarks. Great. Thank you very much. This was a really great discussion. I wish we can go on for longer. Um, I think the talks were excellent, timely, and I think it brought out all the challenges right now we're facing both manufacturing and biology uh, and clinical issues. Um, I, I'd be, I'm very interested in the artisan trial. Um, uh, you know, with the CXCR2. Um, incidentally, um, you know, I was part of a team at MD Anderson who engineered CXCR2 into TILS, and we actually did a clinical trial in TILS, CXCR2 transduced TILS with Patrick Ku based on some really amazing preclinical data, but the trial was, uh, didn't work. It, it didn't show any enhanced efficacy. So maybe it wasn't enough patients, I don't know, it could be but I'd be very interested to see the data uh, coming out of that trial and the role of CXCR2. Uh, one of the things that's I think missing is trafficking. I, I think we need to get better at understanding where these cells are going in the body. And in terms of um, uh, you know, doing some uh, PET analysis for CD8 cells, for example, uh, I think we need to do more of this. I don't think we do enough of that. We don't know how much and where the cells are going. And is there a role for some of these adoptively transferred T cells to go into the uh, tumor draining lymph node where they can get activated by some of these cognate antigens uh, and occult tumor cells? I think there's just not a really appreciation for that. So um, I think this has been really exciting and um, I look forward to um, welcoming everybody at our next session in the fall. So um, thank you very much for attending.